then I am a Jedi. <laughs> Not yet. Happy New Year, Gothamites. Welcome to the 199th episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. Joining me as always, the psychologist to the superheroes, superheroines, and supervillains of Gotham City, and now a galaxy far, far away, Dr. Drea Letamendi. Hello, Drea. Hello, Brian. Happy 2023. Happy 2023. Um, Well, technically, this is our very last episode of 2022. That is correct. I should say, yesterday was your birthday, and I said, Drea, you have the opportunity, anything you want, what would you like to do for your birthday weekend? And you said, I want to record one more episode of the podcast. (laughs) I want to talk about the psychology of Star Wars. Before 2023, I want one more episode of the podcast. So today is January 30, I'm sorry, today is December 31st, 2022. It is New Year's Eve, and you and I have just sat down to talk about Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, and the gang uh, for Return of the Jedi. Um, Return of the Jedi has everything. If you're a psychologist or interested (laughs) in psychology, it has psychoanalytic theory, Freudian theory, uh, family systems, redemption personality psychology it's it's just all there there's there's so much i'm excited to dive in before we do that though uh anything you want to talk about um for uh for for christmas this year you got two blu-rays uh you got the deluxe edition of uh the long halloween Mm -hmm. which had a featurette that you are uh masterfully exhibited in uh and then you also got battle of the super sons which also has a featurette that includes you as well um you've hinted at these things before well i don't watch them (laughs) i never watch them i (laughs) i do the thing i i meet with warner brothers we have a lovely fun engaging discussion about the movie Mm -hmm. that the thing will end up on Mm -hmm. it usually goes into a short documentary Mm -hmm. that's added to the dvd and blu-ray the long halloween was an absolute blast by the way yeah and then for super sons which was written by our dear friend jeremy adams Mm -hmm. um such a fun story that (laughs) that uh documentary is i i know i did watch a little bit i typically (laughs) don't watch these yeah i forget about it i record them forget about it but i i enjoyed watching that one because of the uh absolutely fascinating engaging debut of jim krieg's costume costume which is uh kind of (laughs) so famously when warner brothers interviews jim krieg the writer producer a lot of animated um movies and and specials of uh from from dc uh and a writing partner of jeremy's um he always comes in and does the interview dressed in some sort of elaborate costume uh i remember for uh what was it gotham by gaslight he came in 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 an entire like steampunk outfit and um and and this one he does not disappoint he is i believe jim l uh he is clark's uncle from (laughs) from krypton and uh he is wearing the full-blown richard donner uh kal-el or i guess Mm jor-el costume the the white the bright white lit it works too It, it really lights up the screen yeah anyway so that was a ton of fun. Um, got one more coming up 
next year. I probably won't watch it, but I will. <laughs> but ask, I will. I'll ask others to check it out. Hey, and before we get going with this episode and 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 dive into Star Wars, mm-hmm. I did want to share with everybody that one of the uh, one of my favorite birthday presents this year was a very pristine copy of a Batman comic, specifically Batman number three eighteen from the month and year that I was born. Yep. So 40 some years ago ish <laughs> folks can look it up. Uh, Batman number 318 written by the late great Len Wein. Yeah. Uh, happens to be the first appearance and origin story of Firebug. Yeah. And it's actually a really beautiful cover. I mean, you, you kind of take a chance when, when you do this kind of thing, mm-hmm. it's, Finding the comic, and I think everyone should do this, find the Batman comic or uh, whatever title uh, of of the comic that you love. Look it up, the month and year that you were born. This one is really beautiful. It's uh, it's, it's a cover that is uh, that just kind of jumps off the uh, the page at you. Beautiful. Lots of, lots of bright color. Um, and it, in this particular comic is CGC rated at a 9.0. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it incredibly well kept issue of this uh, of this comic. I'm not going to say the month and year again. Um, I'll let it's people re- <laughs> rewind that. But but uh, but yeah, the the fact that um, it was a great idea, and it was an idea that was given to me by a uh, car who owns our local comic book shop, Earth Two Comics. So um, he said he was like, "Look, when you're when in doubt, always look for a comic book that was published the month and year that uh, the person was born." And Such an awesome idea for yeah, a gift. I was like, "Wow, what a I great idea!" Um, well, I'm glad you enjoy that. So uh, uh, let's talk. Let's fulfill your birthday wish. Let's talk Return of the Jedi. Um, I don't know what your uh, like instant thought is coming in out of Empire Strikes Back and going into Return of the Jedi, but uh, why don't you tell me where your head is as we make that transition into this story? Sure. I have always thought that this movie was structured weirdly. And kind of in a disorienting way, if you're a kid, I I did see this as a kid a number of times, probably more as a kid than I watched this film as an adult. And I always remember the beginning feeling like the end of a movie. Mm. And I have now that I've reflected on it, I think as a kid, there was a period of time when I thought this was the end of Empire Strikes Back. Like the very, so the first third is Jabba's palace Mm -hmm. and escaping the Sarlacc. Middle ish third is yoda dagobah that that wrapping up that relationship Mm -hmm. Uh, spoilers here but yoda dies in the middle of this movie and then the last beastly thick heavy third of this movie is everything that happens on endor spliced in with the events that occur on this uh, operational Fully operational. Fully operational second Death Star. Mm -hmm. I think now watching it again, and I did rewatch it with the intention to kind of see it through a different lens. The the structure works a little bit better for me now. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I am, I have always kind of been confounded by the way that this was written and how the beginning feels like the end. I will say that the very, very end of the film it was like the beginning of another film. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll say that the very end of this film is very satisfying. It wraps up all sorts of um, it, it questions. There's so much truth telling at the very end. And there's so many quieter conversations. There's a lot of action in this, right? But mm-hmm. there are these conversations, these, these um, I guess, slower paced interpersonal moments Vader and Luke, Leia and Luke, mm-hmm. Han and Leia. There, there are just all these moments that are, I think, really uh, instrumental and in kind of telling us about the truth. This is about 
revealing everything, whether you want to know it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, You also see kind of the return of the Campbellian structure, um, the hero going back to his ordinary world, Tatooine, in the beginning of this film. Mm -hmm. Uh, You see, as I said, a lot more action, a lot more world building. And and in fact, uh, as the iterations went on, more and more world building, less and less character development. Mm. Um, so not my favorite, but I would say that rewatching this was, um, w- was a learning experience. I, I appreciated seeing it with my own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course this movie has, uh, your new favorite character in the star Wars franchise, Wicket. Oh, No. <laughs> I never, I never really liked the Ewoks, and yeah. and it, it, you know, full full um, uh, transparency here. We've, I think that we're constantly asking ourselves: Is this supposed to be for twelve year olds? And what do you think? Do you think that this? Do you think that Star Wars is for twelve year olds? Uh, yes. I also think it's for <laughs> not, eight-year-olds, and it's I not think exclusively it's for fifteen-year-olds, and I yeah, I'm. Um, you're talking about just the cutesy nature of the teddy bear-like uh, Ewoks, and you know, it, sort of throwing in these adorable characters when we've not had them throughout the Star Wars franchise up to that point. I think I'm saying there is the. I guess well-known position that this is this is the intended audience mm-hmm. that George Lucas had in mind. Children were tw- he specifically said twelve-year-olds. Yeah, and does that actually manifest? Is this is this story? Obviously, I think it's it transcends a, a generation. I, I think it's for multiple generations. Mm-hmm. Um, but looking back on it, I did see how this third iteration, the final film, meant to answer a lot of questions and also seemed to be friendlier yeah, toward young young little Padawans. And I think that was intentional. After the darkness and the, the heaviness of Empire Strikes Back, I think it was intentional to lighten things up for the third mm-hmm. um for the third third installment at the time. Now we look at it and we go, Oh, this is the sixth installment. Um, and, uh, and really that makes empire sort of the outlier because of the six movies, empire is the one that's the most serious and about, you know, the most dark. And I, I include revenge of the Sith mostly because revenge of the Sith Sith is still a very colorful, bright and colorful movie. Whereas empire has very muted tones, lots of grays and whites and, uh, khakis. Um, but to your point about the, the first part of this movie feeling like the end of Empire, uh, I believe that that was also fully intentional because George Lucas set out to make a, a set of serials. And the way that the serials would work is there would always be a cliffhanger at the end of that episode in order to bring you back to the theater um, for for the finale, and you would then wrap up the storyline from the previous episode and move into a different storyline. And so I feel like he was keeping that serial structure uh, alive with Return of the Jedi. Um, I think, if nothing else, it's a little, uh, and I think maybe this is what you were talking about, it feels a little tacked on, um, where... Uh, what part feels tacked on the, the, the opening of Jedi? Uh, and I wouldn't say it's a third of the movie, but but yeah, that that first part of Jedi to me feels tacked on because uh, it's almost like, well, we got ourselves into trouble at the end of the first movie. Han Solo is now in carbonite. God, we should really just go ahead and get him out of that. You know, like there there was there was no. 
uh, the third movie didn't take the direction of this is us going, you know, this wasn't search for Spock, right? This wasn't them going, all right, we are going to go rescue Han. It was like, no, let's just hurry up and get Han rescued so that we can, uh, we can get onto the bigger Mm -hmm. story, which is another Death Star uh, and the Emperor. Um, And so, yeah, Yeah. it does feel a little tacked on because Han's just not been in carbonite for very long. So, since we're since we've already talked about this the second film yeah i i do want to mention that george lucas spoke to psychologists about these scripts Mm -hmm. in particular um and i've actually pulled a clip for you Mm -hmm. and this is from the making of star wars which i know you've seen Mm -hmm. and it includes a description of his consultation specifically with child developmental psychologists yes wondering about the damage that he could do as a filmmaker by including these devastating uh, um, peaks and climaxes and and reveals Mm -hmm. in particular the scene between luke and vader yeah in the empire strikes back where Luke's hand gets cut cut off and, and more importantly, Vader reveals that he's his father. Mm-hmm. So the psychologist, according to George Lucas, the psychologist said, you're fine because what children tend to do is deny a particular, particular information, especially if that information is too intense emotionally for them to handle which is precisely what Luke does as <laughs> which a is child exactly as what a Luke child did. he denies. It's too in, too intense for him. Yeah, let's listen to this clip. All right, here we go. I was very concerned about this ending, especially in terms of children and whether they'd be able to manage it. You know, because he cuts his hand off, which is very symbolic. And what a young boy would think about this if he had to deal with it, and there's no resolution to it. But I talked to a number of psychologists who basically said that most kids, if it's too intense for them, will simply deny that it's true, that deny that he is his father, thinks he's just lying to him. And most of them said cutting the hand off wouldn't be a problem because he gets a new hand at the end. But those are the kind of things you consider when you're going through a story like this, especially since you know a lot of people are going to see it. What is the potential to cause damage? Okay, so looking back at that, you know, 40 years later, how do you feel about that? Is, is this still, do you still agree with what is being said here? I, I, there's some truth to this. There is actually a term for this. It's called counterfactual thinking. This isn't just for kids. It's for all of us. Mm-hmm. If we go through an experience or learn some information uh, that is uh, traumatic, difficult to hear, uh, different than what we expected, disappointing. We go through this kind of cognitive process in our brain. It's actually a, a healthy human reaction. We create an alternative reality. Oh, that's not true. Or something else happened. Or sometimes we even fantasize about something different happening. Well, what if I uh, had this other experience? Or in the case of Vader, Oh, Vader's just lying to him Mm -hmm. so that he'll join him. This is some kind of evil tactic, right? So basically counterfactual thinking is imagining the ways in which the events in one's life might have turned out differently. Where I think I disagree with the psychologists that supposedly consulted with George Lucas is that sometimes something... It wasn't you. (laughs) Well, no, I... I, No. This is where I disagree. It wasn't me. No, no, no. Uh, Where, (laughs) clearly, where uh, I disagree with the idea that that's the only response Mm. that children will have. Mm. Uh, We have tons of different responses to upsetting information. Well, I know my response was not necessarily that. Your response was you totally believed it. Oh, and loved it. (laughs) I loved it. Um, You know, yeah, I... 
I remember being excited. My mind was blown by this mm, information. Mm-hmm. At no point in time did I think that he was trying to pull one over on him. I was just, and I think it's the reason why I avoid spoilers much today is, is I just love that feeling of the reveal of the mind blowing reveal. And this is one of the first, if not the first occasion that that happened to me personally. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, I love that moment. I already knew. So you went into the movie knowing. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, I can't remember how I knew. Mm-hmm. I just knew. Mm. Um, so I don't get to have that experiment, mm. but just through my practice, I know that there are more responses to something like this. And actually, uh, um, children have gotten news like this yeah. about um, family and relationships. Somebody in their family not being who they thought they were, somebody in their family betraying them, uh, a new family member who they didn't know was in their family, so all sorts of, of dynamics and relationships. And sometimes the reaction is not to refuse the information or deny the information, um, but to be in uh, in a state of devastation, mm. uh, to believe it and, and to be crushed by it and to go through a series or a, a, a period of um, sadness. You're, and, you're, also, you're also literally speaking my language with Optimus Prime in Transformers the movie. The moment you kill that character and all the kids lock themselves in their bathrooms... Uh, oh, those kids and were devastated by the loss of this character. Those kids did not deny that that happened. Yeah. Most of the kids watching that film, I think, knew yeah. that that character had died. So uh, what I will say is that I appreciate that George Lucas even bothered to go to a developmental psychologist and, and to talk about the plans he has for the story and wondering what this would do for the audience yeah. um, psychologically. I think that's really uh, quite cool. It's it's not everyone does that. It's a practice that I. But they should. I, well, for in some cases they should. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the beginning of this movie a little bit because uh, this sort of leads me further down that path of um, I'm sorry, folks, uh, not loving Luke Skywalker. Uh, I really find the plan to rescue Han, to be overly convoluted and um, really makes Luke Skywalker a bit of a dick. Um, the reason I say that is if you, if you look back at the plan now, after having seen it succeed, this plan was literally basically an excuse to go in and murder Jabba the Hutt, right? Like, uh, this wasn't just, we're going to rescue Han. This was, we're going to rescue Han and we're going to shut down this, this criminal organization and we're going to kill Jabba the Hutt. And you could easily say, oh, but, but Luke kept giving him options. He kept, he kept telling him to negotiate. Luke Skywalker was not there to negotiate. Uh, and by the way, as was you know seen in phantom menace sometimes jedi were sent to be the peacekeepers and to negotiate mm-hmm. with light soap sabers uh on their waist like they're ready they're ready to throw down if the negotiations do not do well and and that's exactly what happens here so let's look back at the plan from beginning to end lando has been has infiltrated Jabba's palace, and he is disguised as a guard. There is no reason in the world why Lando couldn't have at some point in time released Han Solo from the Carbonite and gotten him out. There's no reason why you need to even necessarily defrost Han Solo right there in the palace. We can just take the carbonite and do it somewhere else. Um, so there's that. There's there's Lando who's just basically yeah, but, standing but there. But Luke wants to be the hero. This is okay. So this right? is what I'm saying. This this is why he becomes a dick because 
Not only is Lando there. Okay, well, now I'm going to send in two droids, one of whom has no idea what's going on, and the other who is very into it, knows exactly the plan, is carrying Luke's lightsaber mm -hmm. inside of him. Okay, that means Luke already knows this thing's going to go sideways. Uh, he then sends Leia in with Chewbacca to mm -hmm. hand over Chewbacca, knowing that she has to get caught. Like there is no, and it makes me wonder, did Leia know the plan was to get caught? Did Leia know the plan was to end up as a slave girl for Jabba for a few days? Did Leia know any of this? Because she goes in and, and very um, lovingly rescues Han from the Carbonite, says that I'm someone who loves you. I'm here to get you out. Such a great scene. Such a great scene. Jabba has been listening all along. Uh, captures everybody. So now everyone is captured by Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> and Luke gets to save yes. all of them. Yes, Luke shows up and threatens Jabba. So is, is and it's, is like, so you're saying it's Luke's plan for everyone to get caught? Yes, it has to be. Because it is it Luke's plan he, to try try sequentially uh, A through C, and then if those things don't work, I will come in. No, and because save think about your... no, because think about what happens in each situation if it doesn't succeed. Uh, so if the sequence is we're going to send in Lando, Lando doesn't do anything. He just basically, uh, he's basically <laughs> got the inside information. He has scouted the location. He's like, this is where Han is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Then the next part of the plan is to send in Leia with Chewbacca. You're now giving up a member of your party, um, in this ruse. Let's just say... Leia succeeds. Um, let's just say for a second that Leia succeeds in rescuing Han. She gets him thawed out. Jabba doesn't catch them. What happens to Chewbacca now? What happens to Lando now? What happens to C-3PO and R2-D2 now? Like, you couldn't possibly get all those members out quietly without Chewbacca or without Jabba and them like waking up and here. Well, ooh, he, ooh. so he needed R2 to get moved from the palace yeah. to the barge. Yeah. How did he know that the droid chief, I don't know what his name is, but droid boss. Well, it's possible. And this is where I'll give them. It's possible. You could say Lando's gone in there and he has seen to it that the barge, Jabba's sail barge needs oh boy. a droid. Okay. Uh, he could have been the one who got Jabba angry at the previous protocol droid, causing Jabba to destroy the prot protocol droid. We don't know. We don't, mm -hmm. like, we don't know that story. So it's possible that you could be like, okay, this is what Lando's job is. His job is to make sure there are positions for R2 and 3PO. Yeah, I mean, I, I and let me just make a comment about the room where the droids are being dismembered and yeah. tortured and it's just, it just an, it's an interesting thing because droids can't feel at least my understanding is they have a, a, a cognitive parallel mm -hmm. to to human thinking but that i didn't know that they had sensors that they had a sensory system um but they're in there screaming and being tortured and i, I think the value of that is that this entire trilogy is about the descent into a cybernetic slash cyborg um, figure. Yeah. Like this idea that, um, you know, maybe the scene with the, the droids has an element of forecasting or b bringing to us a warning mm -hmm. that this is the kind of destructive, dehumanizing thing that you are currently uh, uh, having feelings about it in disbelief and disappointment and sadness about what's going on with these droids, but the gradual descent into um, a, a cold, lifeless uh, robot yeah. is is happening just before our eyes. I.e., Darth Vader. Well, can we can we 
Can we take that a, a step further and say that this is their opportunity to tell the audience who, like many members of that universe, believe that droids are in some way lesser forms than than the humanoid, mm -hmm. you know, organic characters. This is our opportunity to get a peek behind the curtain and see that while, just like you said, we had no idea that these droids could even feel things, you are now getting to hear the adorable screams of a little droid as it's turned upside down and branded on its feet. Um, uh, so the audience has that um, preconceived, that, that, that prejudice against droids immediately wiped out the moment we find out, oh, they can feel things. Well, and it's droids doing it to other droids. It's like droid yeah. on droid yeah. violence. Yeah. But the the other thing too, that so that scene is important because R2-D2 needs to end up on the barge yeah. because R2-D2 has the green lightsaber. He's got the lightsaber. Right. Hey, right. This so, is actually kind of complicated this is what i'm saying it's too it's too complicated and like, i'm sort of annoyed that luke comes in and he's like i'm a jedi knight oh, and the first thought i had is who made but you who that? appointed you a knight like i get it you're a jedi in training can yeah. you imagine like and those... he left his training after only a couple of days like how long was he it's on insulting because i know a lot of people myself included who've worked hard for a particular certification or license and then you're just like and you just give it to yourself you just you can't just give yourself this title right Right. So he, uh, well, and, and I mean, Han Solo calls him out uh, when Chewbacca he is filling him in and says, Oh, right. And says that Luke's a Jedi Knight. Jedi Knight. God, I'm out of it for a little while. And suddenly everyone gets delusions of grandeur. Oh, can I maybe give Luke a tiny ounce of credit and wonder out loud mm -hmm. is this whole thing a performance? to intimidate Jabba, yes. to make him think, wow, an actual Jedi Knight, yes. dressed in black, confident. There we go. Now, they, keep that in mind, dressed in black. I've never seen a Jedi in black. Mm -hmm. go They're ahead. usually in their hippie right. outfits. Right. So, uh, is this the performance that kind of is meant to intimidate dominate create a sense of fragility for Jabba yes. I, I don't think it works but I well it doesn't work wonder if it, that's the idea it's certainly the idea and he comes out and says that this is the idea uh, you know he, he comes I mean he's he comes in trying to intimidate him even going so far as to trying to use the Jedi mind trick and Jabba's like uh, you're an idiot that doesn't work on me um uh, which I actually appreciate. I appreciate that th these are are the rules coming back to haunt Luke from Star Wars, where he witnesses Obi Wan use the Jedi mind trick on a couple of Daft stormtroopers, but then says that it's basically for the weak minded. Like he mm. he sets the rule and says like if these are strong willed people, it's this probably won't work. And then Jabba's like, yeah, this doesn't work, and even says. That, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Yaddle. Bib Fortuna, oh. uh, is he's like, you're a weak minded fool. Oh. You know, like, you know, it comes right out and says it. Um, but yes, I, I do not think that Luke necessarily believed that he was going to end up in the, or in the, uh, the rancor pit. I do not think that Luke necessarily believed that he was going to go out onto the barge, but I do think that it's possible even that part of the plan was choreographed you know like uh, i'm gonna make sure that r2's where he needs to be uh because notice how luke just kept looking up and see, you know oh there's r2 there's three well he like, tells he tells han who's still mostly blinded yeah. on their way to the sarlacc pit yeah, yeah. that He's, this is his home. Yeah. And I think there's something to that. You know, like he's in his natural environment. He's well familiar with the terrain. He knows about the Sarlacc. He's, he's like, I know exactly where we're going and I know exactly what to do. So 
it seems as though up until the very end, he's still confident that this plan is going to go exactly how he's uh, how he has uh, engineered it. May I ask you about that? So, well, and what's interesting is his choice of words, because he he doesn't say I was born here. He doesn't say I was raised here. He doesn't say this is my home. His He says, I lived here, you know, like it was like <laughs> I used to live here, you know, and then Han says, you're going to die here. You know? okay. It's very, very convenient. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so he's like written off Tatooine. But 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 here's my question is, as a teen growing up in his little white tunic, do you believe he ever encountered a sarlacc? Yeah. Do you, like, do you think yeah. he? Do you think he's familiar with this he level? He and his little of... friends used to try to jump across it. On some... <laughs> no, it, I'm not making this up. I'm, I can't remember where I heard this, but he's he knows about this particular. Yeah, sarlacc. So we're going into the extended universe. Yeah, stuff? Okay. he knows. Okay, all right. Uh, he's very. He knows exactly what he's getting into. They pop wheelies over the yeah, sarlacc. Yeah, ex- exactly. It's, okay, uh, it's his. It's his young. Uh, you know they're very bored on Tatooine. It's a sand yeah, planet. Yeah. There's they're not hooligans. much. There's not much to do, and I would imagine that that's kind of the equivalent of going out and um, skateboarding <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and like uh, blasting womp rats in the yeah. middle of a ravine or a canyon, Beggars Canyon. Um, okay, so so yeah, this whole situation in order to make himself the hero, he ends up putting every other ally he has in jeopardy. Uh, and you, so you find this to be selfish. Yeah. Yeah. I believe this entire movie is about pride and hubris and, and how it creates a, it, it creates your downfall, right? Because when you think about, Jabba had extreme pride and hubris, believing that he couldn't be manipulated by a Jedi, could not come, uh, you fall at the hands of a of a Jedi or whatever. And now, not only do I have Han Solo, but I've also got his companion Chewbacca. Oh, and by the way, now I've got Leia. Now I've got this Skywalker kid. Like he fully believes he has everything under control and decides I'm going to go. Uh, execute these people by making them jump off of a of a uh, uh, plank into a sarlacc pit uh it, there's a lot of hubris happening here and then it's turned on its ear the moment that leia uh wraps a chain around his throat and then strangles him in a extremely brutal manner mm-hmm. right but when you th- take into account this entire plan luke also comes in with a significant amount of hubris he has not finished his training he has given himself the 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 title the title of jedi knight because you know yoda didn't do it um and and, by the way yoda doesn't do it Later, when he goes to yes, Dagobah. yeah, still doesn't do like it. this man never becomes a Jedi master. Well, uh, he he straight up says you've not become a Jedi. Like he <laughs> says, you have to do this first, and like you got to go face him first, and yeah. you know, and then Luke goes and does it. But um, well, should we go into Dagobah? Well, sure, but I do want to point this out when you follow Luke. Again, we go white tunic to gray khakis to now wearing solid black. Um, and his bangs are getting a little straighter. He, he, <laughs> he, is, he's, he is walking down the path to the dark side, right? Like he is, and, and his pride he's now and got his hubris, the mechanical hand. He's got the mechanical hand. Which he's reminded of every once in a while. He'll, he'll try to shove that, that little thing into a glove and yeah. look down and realize... Uh, he is becoming something else. This mm-hmm. is the transformation. This mm-hmm. is the possible descent into darkness. Mm-hmm. This is the giving into the shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, and while I agree with you, you think this movie is about hubris and personality. I agree with that. I think this movie is also about authenticity, truth telling, masks, uh, layers, performances, which I think Star Wars is. Sure. Like, I think that's, I mean, maybe it's just because. 
I love Andor, and I think that's what Andor is about. But that's what this film is about for me, is whether you're in that uh, Slave Leia bikini or in a, a bouche mask uh, or, you know, wrestling with whatever your outward appearance is, you're, you're constantly uh, confronted with and navigating your personal self and using that to manage your, your values. Mm -hmm. That's what I think this is about. Um, and I'll pause there because we're going to see it later in, in one of the most, um, thrilling and well-known finales, the, the final battle between the emperor Luke and Vader. Right. I am certainly going to save the majority of this conversation for a movie down the road. I don't want to get too far into it, but, uh, but during a recent reveal during a TV series, so spoiler alert for anyone who has not seen the Mandalorian, specifically the finale of season two, Luke Skywalker makes his reappearance after uh, Jedi, he is still wearing this black outfit. <laughs> he is, he, uh, I understand why he didn't change clothes down on the forest moon of Endor because, you know, he just didn't have anything to anything else to wear. Um, but, but even after this movie, he sticks with the same. And, wh and what is black your problem with outfit? That? What's your problem with wearing all black? It is, well, there's, let me make clear, I have no <laughs> problem me. with wearing all black, but he, it is meant to be a visual representation of where he is mentally and personally and the way that the darkness is taking him over up until the moment that he defies the emperor by refusing to kill Vader and refusing to, like, you know, when he chucks well, his sure. lightsaber... I wonder, though, that but that's kind of the point I'm making is that he's not succumbed to evil. He has faced evil. He's even integrated evil in some way. You, mm. you can't do that thing yeah. where, that we talked about earlier and just deny and say that thing didn't happen. He was not my father. Right. I think wearing that black tunic in a way is honoring his father. There was some good in him. And well, OK, so let's talk about tunic that. Wearing tunic means that I... I claim him. I acknowledge him. I connect to him. Okay. And I'm going to use that energy and use that power for good. I'm going to save this little Grogu guy and bring him back. And then later, I'm going to do some things that <laughs> I should not be doing with him, like forcing him to choose whether he wants to be a, man, a Mandalorian or Jedi. Right. Well, anyway, that's the tangent we won't go get into. Sure. But but something um, struck me as very interesting. Mark Hamill sent a tweet uh, to Peyton Reed, who directed that episode, and said, thanks for allowing me to revisit Luke Skywalker at a time where he was the symbol of hope and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but... What strikes me as interesting about this tweet is that it suggests that Mark Hamill, throughout his career of playing Luke Skywalker, played him with hope. And when I look back at the Star Wars franchise, that first tr trilogy, I don't see Luke Skywalker as playing that hope you know in star wars he certainly got hope he looks out at the twin sons that also may not be hope that may be complete dismay like just you know looking at the twin sons this is all i have to look forward to there's got to be something bigger out there i'm never going to see it uh you know whatever but you could say that in star wars he was hopeful uh i don't necessarily see that carry over beyond that you know he then gets his first taste of victory. And again, he's the last person standing uh, when this happens. He's the last X-Wing pilot. The last, there are no Y-Wings. There are no X-Wings. There are no A-Wings there helping him. Uh, so it fuels the, the ego a little bit. He gets handed a medal. Um, by the way, Han Solo still wearing his outfit. Uh, Luke Skywalker all done up. He's like, I'm going to get a new jacket, I'm getting some new pants, I'm getting a new shirt, and I'm getting this shiny metal. <laughs> um, 
from that point on, Luke decides to do things on his own a lot. He leaves the group to go to Dagobah. He decides, my friends are in trouble. I'm going to dismiss the counsel of my master, of my my teacher, my tutor. And I'm going to leave knowing full well that that little guy thinks I could die in this moment because I'm not ready. Mm-hmm. My friends could die, you know, whatever. He leaves. Uh, does I do not get the impression that he returned for additional training prior to coming back to Yoda because when he comes back to Yoda he's like I've got to complete my training and Yoda's like oh, oh Yoda, Yoda it's is too late Yoda's like I'm on my deathbed yeah I, go. and I'm not here to serve you right like and I actually appreciated that like when the time was right when we were together I did the best I could mm-hmm. to instill not just the physical training but the values mm-hmm that would lead to important attitudes that you're going to carry on for the rest of your life. Yeah. But I'm not here. Like I, I appreciate that Yoda had his own kind of conclusion to this. And it's not unrealistic for a teacher, a mentor, a therapist, whoever is kind of instilling uh, um, helpful developmental things for us that, that they will not always be there. Right. So, it's sad. It but it is. He goes. It is. Um, and I wonder if he faked his death. Like I'm so done with you. I gotta oh, go. I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go. Uh, but then at the end of the movie, he shows up cocky as hell when he gives himself over to Where, Vader. When is this? Oh, it, when he gives himself over to Vader. So so let me ask you this question because he says something. Uh, by this point he infiltrates the death star vader knows he's coming Mm -hmm. he knows vader knows Mm -hmm. that he knows yeah emperor not so much he's not on the same wavelength in what way uh, because vader tells the emperor i mean vader told or or the emperor told vader to bring him to him uh, before he gets onto the death star yeah vader tells the emperor like he's on that ship yeah, yeah, yeah. And the emperor did not feel right. his presence. Right. That was the emperor's opportunity to tell Vader, I wonder where your loyalty is yeah. because you're feeling something that I don't. Which, by the way, we now know after having revisited Empire, Vader's loyalty isn't necessarily to the emperor anymore. Like he already tried to win over his son to kill, the, sure. to kill the emperor so that the two of them could lead the galaxy together. But still cloaked in a lost psychology like even that attempt was not fully developed i don't think it was i I think up till this up till in the very end he's still in this kind of lost phase the thing that i was thinking about is that when luke confronts the emperor Mm -hmm. he tells him we're both dying on this death star Mm -hmm. Which I never thought about it until this viewing. And I kind of wanted to ask you, was his intention to be blown up with all three of them? Like, this is the end of the three of us. We're going to be blown up. Because he tells the emperor, Mm -hmm. you're going to die. I'm going to die. And you're going to die with me when this thing blows up. Uh, Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think it's possible that he knew that it was a potential suicide mission. I don't know that it was necessarily... um, his ultimate plan to his second suicide attempt. Yeah. In some it, way. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think it was uh, a plan to, to die there, but I think he, he went in knowing that it was a strong possibility, but that he wasn't going to go alone. Um, he was going to make sure he saved the day by himself again. Right. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> it, 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 okay. So you're saying he goes in, he's confident. I mean, uber confident. And, and I don't think, by the way, and, and, and this takes me back to that tweet. I don't see it as hope. I do not see it as hope. I, I see it as overconfidence. I see it as uh, there's an extreme amount of pride there. He comes right out and basically says, 
you know, uh, th- there might be hope when he's saying, you know, father, I can sense there's still some good in you. Mm-hmm. You've got a shot, you know, whatever. But he also walks right into that chamber, that throne room, basically being like, oh, this is over and you don't even know it. Like, I'm I'm not walking out of here having not succeeded. It's the same self-assurance he has with Jabba. And which is why I'm yeah. wondering what kind of um, kind of self uh, navigation is happening mm. where he acts a little differently with Vader, but the the face he's presenting to the emperor, this overly assured, mm-hmm. I've already won mm-hmm. mentality, mm-hmm. that's very different than what he presents with Vader. He's forced to fight him, mm-hmm. but in that fighting... He's like, I know underneath all this, the mask, the the um, the breathing device, the cybernetics, there's a, a human person and that human person is just like me. And I can't survive unless I connect to one of very few people that I'm supposed to understand. Yeah, that's a that's a di- different like I think. And those conversations are happening at the same time, almost, as the conversation he's happening with the Emperor. I'm not disagreeing with you. I think he comes into this, like, but fully he, equipped um, yeah. with this sense that he knows what's going to happen. But that, then that loses control the moment Vader realizes that a sister is in play. And he's yeah. like, well, if I can't turn you, then maybe I can turn her. And then that's when Luke loses his mind and allows the rage to take over. And he basically pins Vader to the floor cuts off his other or cuts off his mechanical hand again. Um, then looks down at his own mechanical hand, realizing, Oh, I've been played. And then chucks his lightsaber, refusing to, uh, to, to, to participate, to participate, in this. which yeah. again, I don't see as hope. I see it as no, no, no. I can't be played like this. I'm coming out of here victorious. Even if I have to defiantly allow you to electrocute me, you know, whatever, trust me, my dad's going to come rescue me because Luke also has the information that Vader wants Palpatine dead. He already knows that that was, that was on the table at one point. Mm -hmm. And so the moment he's like, okay, I'm going to give myself up to to the to the emperor refusing to kill my father refusing to take his place emperor's like okay then you're going to die starts to electrocute him and and luke starts pleading with his father you know help me please and that's the moment that vader then decides to turn now I remember this being a much bigger deal as a kid, Vader wrestling with whether he should help his son or not. Um, looking at the yeah, that little looking moment at the emperor, where he's looking at the emperor, looking, looking back at, his, at son. his son, looking back at the emperor, then suddenly deciding, no, I'm going to pick up the emperor and throw him um, down this shaft that leads directly to the core of the Death Star. Which, by the way, talk about hubris. You have created a throne room. That has a shaft that leads directly to the core oh, of the uh, of the of the Death Star. <laughs> you you are what is happening? I don't know. All these people and all this pride. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, but but Vader then decides to pick up the Emperor and throw him down this shaft. Was is Vader genuinely redeemed in this moment, or is he just fulfilling? the plan he had already just laid out to Luke in empire where it's like together we will kill the emperor and we will rule the galaxy right. as father and son. Well, you know, in the same way, I believe that someone doesn't snap into a violent predator. Like the media tends to teach people. Someone doesn't suddenly turn and connect to good values. Yeah there was a process happening and i think that his we were we were getting moments 
of contemplation and reflection. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think in the films, even though this wasn't as intentional as maybe it looks now, remember those moments where we would see Vader in his um, healing chamber mm -hmm. and you'd have those glimpses of him in his own loneliness, mm -hmm. in his own isolation, mm -hmm. this idea that he is lost and misunderstood and lacking purpose. Yeah. Sure, he he has this, especially in this movie, he's meant to make sure this the, this giant space weapon is complete. The other part of this is that he is in a continual search to understand who he is now with all of the mechanical pieces and the, the terrible destructive things he's done. So he's trying to integrate all of that. I mean, that's kind of the symbolism of the wiring and the buttons and the lights and all that is how does, how does this being integrate? How does this all work? How mm -hmm. is this a system? And so I think there are moments, that one that you just described, him realizing, I don't want my son to die. I'm going to turn on the emperor. That is probably more of a turning point in the transformation, like a very crucial, critical one. Mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily the singular thing that turns him do you think that there's also the fact that it parallels revenge of the sith where he is using the force lightning against mace windu who is blocking it with his lightsaber and then ultimately kills mace window mace windu by using the force lightning to chuck him out of the the window um he is now basically seeing a similar dynamic happening where luke is now on the ground mm -hmm. he is not using the force lightning but he's having the force lightning used upon him like this is the moment that he signed his life away to palpatine by helping him against mace well, windu I, I like that now, bookend. Yeah, yeah now now's my chance to to kind of repair yeah the the decision i made was the wrong one yeah and maybe i'm in a place where i am empowered to make the right decision right uh, and again, and I think this movie has always been a favorite or, or Star Wars has been a favorite of mine because of the struggle of understanding what's good and what's bad mm -hmm. and, and the fallacy that you're always all good or that you're always all bad. Mm -hmm. The idea that somebody we've come to, uh, to associate with terror becomes the hero. He is uh, the return this Jedi, the return of the Jedi is not, Luke's not even a Jedi, right? Not, not the return of the Jedi is Anakin Skywalker. Yeah. And he's made this final revelation that he can restore the values that were in him somewhere deep down and the action that he needs to take. He converts those values into something meaningful mm -hmm. because values aren't really anything unless you convert it into behavior. Mm-hmm. He turns it into something meaningful by killing the emperor and ending the reign of terror. And ultimately sacrificing himself because he knows this can't go well for him either. I wonder too, I think I get the impression that he knows it's over for him by that point. Yeah. Right? Now one can argue, so all of the psychoanalytic folks are going to say he's not really doing this for for Luke in particular, maybe he's doing this so that Luke can live on and kind of symbolize Anakin's um, presence, symbolize yeah. his legacy or whatever. I, I don't know that I see that here. I see a genuine uh, and remarkable transformation in Vader to do the right thing. Yes, it's his son. Yes, it's someone he cares about. Yes, he has a connection there. But fundamentally, this is about doing what is fundamentally a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, absolutely turning around, not, I would say like almost subverting 
the self idea, the, the, the self perception that he's an evil thing, that he's an evil person. You can't be, you, you can't have an action like that yeah. and continue on that path. Right. It may have also been a, um, it may have also been a, uh, and this is just something I'm thinking about now remembering the moment, but if, if he has resigned himself to the fact that this is it for me, I'm, I'm going to go, Yeah. but I can't go and leave Palpatine here to do potentially worse things with another apprentice. Um, I got to go ahead and just take him out too. I like that thought too. What's happened to me is so destructive and, and, I've always liked Darth Vader, but I think the prequels give some humanity to him, right? Like what happened to him, he didn't just independent independently go on this uh on on this pursuit of terror. Mm-hmm. Somebody this very guy, the emperor, Emperor Palpatine, groomed him, used and manipulated his unsettled, unmature feelings of jealousy and rage Mm -hmm. this kid never really had a a a healthy relationship a healthy parent a healthy mentor outside of his first you know five years Mm -hmm. six years of life so this is in some ways um him wanting to ensure that this predator doesn't do this to anybody else yeah yeah again in this in this final scene i i i just see like uh, i i think the emperor's hubris believing that there's no chance that vader would turn on him is ultimately his downfall believing that he was he believed that he was in control of the situation entirely um that that his elaborate convoluted plan you know i'm gonna lure you here you're eventually going to strike down your father. I'm going to make sure you're angry enough that you, that you then join me. Um, and it all turned sideways and suddenly the emperor's in the core of the, of the death star. Um, and, uh, and again, Luke is that kid that needs to have won needs to know he's won. The worst possible thing that Vader could say to Luke is tell your sister, you were right about me. <laughs> like <laughs> You were right. You and were right Luke's, this whole Luke's time. Looks like I was right. Yeah. You know, like I, 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 I just, so yeah. how do you feel? How do you feel about that very last scene where Luke is with Vader? I, I found this to be troublesome at the pyre. Well, no, not in the, not then. They're still on the the Death Star, and this is uh, in the middle of self destruction. Yeah, there's a military uniformed uh, staff running, evacuating. Uh, yeah, and then there is no order anymore. No, but Luke is uh, bending over Darth Vader. This is before he takes off the mask, right? He's dragging him across the floor, mind you. Like it's such a just juxtaposition yeah. of this, of this. Um, well, what what these guys would consider the enemy, this Jedi dragging Vader to to the ship. Yeah, and all these people just fleeing and not really caring. Yeah, they don't care. It's a it's a weird thing. It's like oh. This little tiny relationship, no one cares about that. Yeah, and I don't think most, uh, you know, Joe Stormtrooper has no idea who Luke Skywalker is. Like, I don't think anyone running by sees this kid as like a potential enemy. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think he's dressed in black. He, he might be one of us. Um, but what is eerie is knowing that all these people who are terrified of Vader are now watching Vader being dragged across the they're floor not even, and, and just laid down right. and they don't care. And they're, they're not just even running. watching it. Yeah. They're just running past it. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, I don't know how, you know, uh, produced that was, but I found that you use the word eerie. Like I found that to be um, deeply felt mm-hmm. because this is the story of the hero's journey. And fundamentally it is kind of insignificant 
it's so small. Yeah, it's it's only important to you, like to the to the to the people who are having that moment and in that relationship. Like the rest of the world, it's so it's the you like hear the footsteps. Yeah, of all these people fleeing. the The other thing too is, of course, the moment that Vader is unmasked is is a huge psychological moment. What is behind this mask? And I do remember as a kid being horrified by this. Um, this is not who I thought was back there. I didn't even know if there was a person back there. Yeah, and I did because not know I know what to your expect. love of robots. Did you, were you disappointed uh, to find out that there was a person well, back there? And I, I look at, I look upon it now with my own eyes <laughs> and I see, and I see someone and I realize my disappointment. He's so fragile. He's, um, he, he looks both human and not yeah. like his head is shaped strangely. He has strange features, but his eyes are there. And I know dark that, circles under his eyes. He looks really tired. He's like, I'm so done. Yeah. Um, and I know they re redid this look for him. They took away his eyebrows after like one or two revisions. Mm -hmm. I think 2004, um, maybe 2008 i can't remember but a couple of um a couple of additions made yeah. some changes to his face and he is he still essentially looks the same but. yeah he's he's it's ghastly and i think that's kind of the point um because he's because he's also somewhat um endearing in that moment and you're right he tells luke I believed in you. You were right the whole time. And it's time for me to be done. Mm -hmm. And I like Luke's response, which is no, I refuse for that to be true. Again, the counterfactual thinking. But then it is true. But that, you know, again, yeah, you, you, it's it's a, a, a kid who's like, no, I won't let this happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then he just doesn't have that control. Um, I think for me, one of the more troubling moments is the end of the movie when Luke sees the force ghosts of Obi-Wan <laughs> and Yoda suddenly joined by Anakin. I know where you're going with this. And who is that young man? Uh, no, because I don't watch that. I just, okay. I can't, I, I don't, I, I refuse. Like, to, it's Sebastian Stan. He, he, he should be, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> definitely it's not, not, definitely, definitely not, definitely not Sebastian, Sebastian, Stan. Sebastian Stan. It's Sebastian Shaw. Uh, he, he, he is the one who redeemed himself. Therefore, he is the one who should be allowed to be wearing Jedi robes, That's standing fair. next to Yoda and Obi-Wan. But what I'm concerned about is like Yoda who's like in the middle and he looks up at him and you're like, I never liked you when you were a kid or when you were a teen or when you were a young adult. And I've certainly not liked you in the last 20 years that you've been Vader. Like, uh, is oh, Yoda okay. upset? Like Yoda has to stand <laughs> there yeah. next to Anakin. It's like, I refused to train you when you were five. And I'm like, I don't like that you're you standing still here next to me. You're not a Jedi now. Knight to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah oh, if Yoda, weird. if Yoda looked up at Anakin, and was like, "You're still not a Jedi Master." <laughs> we never approved you. You were <laughs> yeah. never certified. Yeah. 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 We don't claim you. Uh, a little weird. But it is now, a weird. and we can't go into this too deeply. But after having seen, oh, can I say something quickly? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think it could work when it was Sebastian Shaw. I think it did work because Yoda didn't tell Luke, "You need to go and kill your father." Yeah, he said, "You need you to, to confront him. confront him." Yeah, and maybe the prophecy is that this young kid, as uh, uh, unready and as immature as he is is our only hope and is the one who's going to uh, convince or, or, or create some sense in, in whatever human part is left of Anakin, yeah. not to destroy him, but to bring, to, to destroy Vader and to bring Anakin back. Right. And I think in that way, it does work with him being a force ghost. Sure. But it's still uncomfortable. It's still an uncomfortable reunion 
I would imagine. Sure. <laughs> where he was like, oh, I hated you all along. Um, yeah. I, but what's interesting is now, after having been told by Yoda, you're the last of us. Now you need to go and pass on what you've learned, which is very little. Um, thank God there's some convenient books that he can read now because there's a lot of training he's not had. Um, but, but he's like, go and pass on what you've learned to your sister and to others. Um, and, and again, this is after having really experienced nothing but victories and very important victories. Um, Luke Skywalker is probably filled with even more pride and it's the batman it's the batman mentality of it can only be me uh i can take on apprentices i can do all this other stuff but really i'm the only one who is powerful yeah. enough to do any of this stuff and and so i have no doubt that this kid left this experience created his little jedi school and probably lost it at some point when well we will get to that when he experienced failure yeah yeah, yeah. like yeah. that, that I, I have no I problem i hear with. you saying that this kid uh grew up kind of understimulated yearned for something bigger immediately got thrown into this adventure learned he had this amazing power mm -hmm. experienced success after success things kind of working out for him mm -hmm. Up until the very end where he literally, I would say twice now, saved the galaxy. Yeah. And uh, let me add that I think there was some adversity in those experiences, but not maybe the right dose, not enough. Maybe the failure that you're saying is what would have created a little bit more uh, of a sense of true resilience in yes. this guy. Yes, yes. That's yes, uh, to me, and this isn't going to mean as much to you, but it, this is the high school quarterback who has never known anything but victory, has won the state championship all four years of their career, has never known, uh, then went on to college and and won the national championship and then got drafted by the Cleveland Browns. And now he's experiencing failure for the very first time in his life. And it's, the, it's crumbling everything. It's crumbling everything analogy. inside of him. Like I, I it, it's. Well, the better you are, the worse the team is that's going to got uh, it. Okay, that's going to draft you. Um, and so, and so, the, this is him now experiencing you know potential failure for the first time um, later, which which can't, we're not talking about. But well, yes. and I can understand why so many uh, young people, kids especially, adored Luke because we are just projecting our own fantasies onto him. And again, the hero's journey, which I appreciate as a paradigm, kind of falls flat when it comes to the the true development of the self, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of what you're talking about, I think, um, a fuller picture of what these experiences might be. Yeah. Uh, and I never took to Luke I, I'd say there, you know, again, I've said this before. I don't think there's a character I projected on probably three PO because that worrisome, anxious, <laughs> uh, uh, hypochondriacal character is very relatable. Just constantly carrying the worries when no one else is noticing the dangers. Yeah. There's got to be somebody who's like, I feel like I'm the only rational person here and I'm out of control all the time. Um, but other than that, no, I didn't really project onto Luke or Leia uh, or Han. But I'd say yeah. that Vader is, I, I didn't necessarily project onto Vader, but I learned a huge lesson from this character, even before the prequels, which is a, a, a huge consideration that I think a lot of us are doing right now is how do I, how do I separate the evil from the person? How do I separate a person's actual personality mm -hmm. from the things that they're doing? Yeah. Can we even do that? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Leia because 
where I don't necessarily see Luke as being the embodiment of hope, I do see Leia as being that character. I see. I agree. I see Leia as being that driving force, um, that 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 character who does feel the hope and does do everything within her power to um, to win for the good of the community, not necessarily for her own, you know, pride or or ego. But but to me, Luke and Leia are the yin and yang. I, I think for him, it's all about himself. And for her, it's all about the the rebellion, and has always been that way. Um, how do you feel at the end of Jedi? Oh, about Leia in particular. Yeah, I I have always liked her. I think she's pretty consistent through the trilogy. I think she softens quite a bit, and I don't mean that in a in a derogatory or a negative sure. way. I she goes from hard as nails in star wars to then being that character with her hair down and she's got a lot of very tender moments in jedi um she comes right out and i mean the very first time you see her she is telling han solo she loves him and that's not something we would have seen leading up to this moment right uh really and then uh and then she manages to regain that toughest nails by being the one who actually kills Jabba and releases herself from imprisonment. I, I, this is and this is why uh, the you know whatever uh, imagination created this character because I don't think it was just one person, but mm -hmm. as a as a character that many of us have looked up to particularly female fans of Star Wars, there is that sense that she is full-bodied that she's mm -hmm. uh not just a tough uh obstinate smart woman no. she's also multi-dimensional mm -hmm. she's capable of love and tenderness she's capable of wisdom she's capable of patience i remember that scene where like han is like out of himself and he's quite angry that she says that she loves luke this is near the end of the film and he's not angry Oh, he's, he, well, he's not, I'd say that he's, he's saddened. He's, he's upset. disappointed. He's upset. He's disappointed. And he's like, I guess I'll take myself out of this. And uh, you're right. He's not, he's not, he's been angry before. Yeah. He's not angry here. He's a little bit more uh, in a state of acceptance. Yeah. Uh, but she, I'm just like, tell him, just tell him, just yeah, say, yeah. Thank, yeah, yeah. tell him. And she takes so much time to explain her relationship with luke and um i think that's what's so admirable about her she's not in she doesn't exist to comfort others she works she, she she acts with her own like confidence and assurance mm -hmm. and so she doesn't she doesn't serve to appease and comfort but, and heal other people. But the difference is the moment that he expresses pain over this, she recognizes it sure. and does comfort him. She does yes. say, No, it's not like that at all. He's my brother. Which by the way, it occurs to me that Han Solo and Chewbacca are like the least informed characters in the entire trilogy <laughs> because uh I do not recall, maybe I'm wrong, I do not recall a scene in which Luke tells Han that Vader's his father, because it, it, he finds out after Han's already been frozen in carbonite, mm -hmm. Han is then released from the carbonite, but Luke and them separate before Han even finds out that Vader is his father. Um, and then only finds out after Leia has already found out that Luke is her brother. Like, can you imagine Han Solo's reaction when he sees Luke bring down the body of the man who had him imprisoned in carbonite and is sadly having a little funeral pyre for him? A very honorable one. <laughs> a very honorable one where... 
Why Hans didn't you like, just leave uh, him on that Death Star? Like, I'm sorry, what is happening here? I'm I saved you from this guy in the first movie. Hmm. He dropped me in Carbonite in the second movie, and now you're honoring him with you know. So the moment that he finds out that his best friend's dad was Darth Vader, there's got to be so much happening in that mind of of his. Mm-hmm. But uh, we never get to see that because Han Solo is a relatively two dimensional character. <laughs> um, but I do love Leia in this. I, I think even she, she has an incredible amount of wisdom and patience. Um, she manages to calm all the, the Ewoks into uh, loaning her a dress that presumably came off of somebody they ate previously. So then let me ask you this other question, uh, because we were talking about Vader and we were talking about this potential of redemption. Um, and Lucas has come right out and said that the entire franchise was really supposed to be about the downfall and then rise again of, of Anakin Skywalker. And presumably, <clears throat> presumably that's what's happened at the end of this movie. But I want to ask you as a psychologist, and you were talking about separating the violence from the person, do you believe that Darth Vader has adequately redeemed himself by the end of Return of the Jedi? That is the core of this trilogy, right? That's the name of this movie, The Return of the Jedi. Does he, does Darth Vader come back to his, his uh, original if we can say mm -hmm. that state of being good, has he redeemed himself? And I think a lot of people come away with it feeling like he has redeemed himself. Uh, but the question about redemption and, and restoring one's goodness, this, this idea, this is something that we're constantly talking about now, right? Mm -hmm. Can we separate, um, evil behavior, what we think is evil behavior from the person who's engaging in it. If you're doing evil things, doesn't that just make you evil? Can you separate the artist from their beliefs? That's mm -hmm. sort of constant question that, that we, uh, at least a lot of us are having. And it's very specific to the work that I do in better understanding interpersonal violence. And once someone is in that world and is an interested in violence, is that the end for them? Can they be restored? Can they be redeemed? What what can we do to turn things around for them? I think it's a question that we're constantly asking, which is why, for me, Star Wars is is going to stand or going to withstand the test of time. Um, but it all kind of goes back for me to your favorite period of time with psychology, which is the mid '60s mm -hmm. and the shock experiments the golden age the golden age um, the wild west of psychology experiments yeah i mean we learned a lot during that era but the the experiments that most people know as the shock experiments you and i know as the milgram, milgram experiments and those quite historically and classically are the experiments in which um subjects were basically told by a lab coat wearing experimenter to administer gradually, in, uh, gradual, in, increasingly uh, more intense shocks to uh, a person in another room. Mm -hmm. um, that person being someone who was randomly placed there, and you could uh, supposedly hear them screaming on the other side of the wall. Um, I, uh, I've mentioned the study before, but there are great videos that you can watch that that show all the different elements of these experiments i mean if you like watching the torture of a unseen person in another room yeah, uh, there's some sure, great videos sure. to watch well the reason why we always come back to those studies and there's some flaws to those studies of course but we come back to those studies because the whole purpose of that exploration was to better understand this this human behavior called obedience and conformity mm -hmm. and to what lengths will somebody go to what are the elements what are what is the formula needed in order for somebody who is a quote normal human being to engage in violent behavior yeah and i relate this to darth vader because i i think back to 
uh, not this trilogy, but the prequel trilogy that tells us a little bit about the the situations that took place for him to be in a vulnerable state for somebody to harness that fragility and that uh, jealousy and that hatred and to take those emotions and to convert that into other kinds of emotions that are more oppressive, that are more destructive. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we see in human history, the ability for someone who's, who has a cloak of power to be able to manipulate other people, make them do things that they may not otherwise do and we have already talked about Anakin Skywalker having elements or having some uh, uh, symptoms of certain mental illnesses like borderline personality disorder and, and maybe some anxiousness and some other things, but, but basically relational dysfunction. And I think that plays into it as well. But other than that, he his state of mind, his vulnerability is what is what it's really being preyed upon. Mm-hmm. And that vulnerability is no different than the vulnerability that you and I have. Right. Uh, so, so that connection there uh, is something that is uh, maybe a fundamental lesson for us all. When we see the emperor electrocute Vader behind the mask, you see that human skeletal skull profile Mm -hmm. right and that tells us that's you like that's us that's you that's anybody that's a person Mm -hmm. behind there Mm -hmm. luke is basically telling us that there is a path to redemption and within that path is a shared understanding that none of us that no one is inherently good or evil but we have capacity for both and Luke is essentially trying to bring out the good that he knows is a part of Darth Vader. He has to fully recognize that in him. And Darth Vader has to experience someone, or rather Anakin, has to fully experience someone seeing the value, the, the worthiness, the good in him. Because up till now, he's sort of been a tool. He's mm-hmm. been a weapon. Mm-hmm. He's been minimized. And then his, as we've talked about, his cybernetic uh, body, his the the way that he is as a as a person is is completely disfigured, right. and so he has he he really needs that. He really needs to be seen as a person. Um, getting back to the Milgram studies, just for a moment here, this is for all of us, right? How do we confront and overcome the possibility? we could engage in nefarious things simply because someone of authority is telling us that we need to do this or that this is our uh, God given uh, uh, goal uh, or that terrible things will happen to us if we don't. Now, remember those Milgram studies had very few consequences. People were told like, you can just walk away from this if you want to. And a ton of people stayed and shocked their counterparts simply because someone in lab coat was telling them that's what they needed to do. So the first thing we have to do, which I think Luke does, is to question the authority's legitimacy. So what makes this government, this figure, this person um, really in charge? In those studies, it, it was interesting. It was the lab coat. It was the fact that it was a white male saying, this is what you need to do. Mm-hmm. It, and this is why I feel like Star Wars is a lot has a lot to do with like... Um, mask wearing and performances like the emperor is quite a performance if you look past the cloak and the weirdly disfigured face and like all that like who is this person it's very mysterious but i'm sure there's something uh when he he tells luke that that's luke's weakness which by the way is also something that yoda was trying to tell luke as well was you're your friends ha- are your weakness. Yeah, you're you're going to have to sacrifice. Like you need to stay here so that you can become powerful enough to go up against Vader and the Emperor. Uh, don't go save your friends. Those attachments are only going to like bog you down. Basically, like he he, both sides were saying. Well, your, that's where your personal attachments are are going yeah, to be your downfall. That's where the Sith and Jedi kind of agree. Yeah, attachments are not good for us. Mm-hmm. Um. 
uh, above and beyond questioning authority figures, something we need to do in this wrestling uh, with ourselves is, is to look inward and really to ask ourselves, like, what would I do on my own initiative? What what is within my repertoire that feels more authentic? Is it following these orders or is it walking away from this? Is it doing something different than what I'm being told to do? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then lastly, and really uh, something that's super important when we're trying to subvert or confront authority, especially when that authority is asking us to engage in violence is looking toward our peers. Like what, what can I gain from community what who around me shares my values and and could be a sounding board is this the right thing are we doing the right thing Mm -hmm. and that's where luke kind of he doesn't really do that as much um ultimately he ends up making the right decision Uh, but i think there's something to his connection with his friends that compels him but i'm also concerned about that connection or lack thereof like maybe he's listening to yoda and maybe he's listening to the emperor too much because even at the end of the movie, he leaves his friends behind to have this funeral, this private funeral for Vader. Uh, and then goes and stands by himself next to a tree in order to look at some force ghosts. His friends are constantly coming over to him. Mm-hmm. Like, and and by the way, this started in Empire when he decided to go off on his own. Like they they've not been a collective since the first movie. They they've always been separate. And uh, and at the end of Jedi, Luke is by himself again until all of his friends come over and put their arms around him, and they're like, "Hey, dude, don't be such a sulky." mess over here it's as if he has transcended friendship yeah kind of i mean it's he kind of he kind of thinks he's on a different plane i'm telling you that's the thing that's the thing yes you you've you've nailed that and that's the again that's that pride that's that hubris that's that this is a kid who believes he's untouchable and i just can't imagine that not biting him in the butt later regardless of what timelines or stories or canon you want you know Mm -hmm. i i just i don't see this ending especially well for luke skywalker after this movie i certainly don't disagree with you yeah well now we're done we're done that's that's it that's all star wars right like we've got no more star wars left we have many Star Wars We've left. We've got many Star Wars left. So yeah, we do have we're gonna go right into the uh into the the newer trilogy. Uh the the, the newest trilogy. Yeah. The The sequels. The sequels. Um, the sequels. The squeakles. We're going to uh finish up our analysis of Andor very soon. Um if you've not already Go to Patreon and uh, join our our Patreon in order to hear the latest analysis of of Andor. Um. So, Drea, what, what what do you think we have to look forward to? Psychologically speaking, after the destruction of a second, even bigger Death Star, there's going to be another space weapon clearly they just keep <laughs> building even them bigger and even I think bigger it'll be, space it'll be an interesting journey as you know these things are cyclical the hero's journey is supposed to be cyclical mm. we're going to see a very similar almost parallel story with young ray in the next film uh, uh but i think there are going to be some differences too there there is the uh the legacy of the jedi which we'll certainly talk about uh, but I think there's going to be some space to talk about some of the detriments and failings of those philosophies yeah. and where some characters really subvert that and others um, might become ultra committed. Right, right. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, in the meantime, I want to uh, wish everyone 
a very happy new year in 2023. And um, Drea, why don't you tell those folks where they can celebrate with you online? You can go to my website, drdreapsychology.com. There is a button there to leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find me on social media at Arkham Asylum Doc on Twitter and Instagram and at Dr. Drea on Hive and Mastodon. You can find me on Twitter at BWard028. You can find me on Instagram at B underscore Ward028. Uh, I believe I'm at BWard028 on Hive again. And then um, at Brian Ward on Mastodon. Um, and then... Um, you can follow us both on Twitter at Arkham Sessions or on Instagram at the Arkham Sessions. Email us at Arkham Sessions at gmail.com. Come follow us on Facebook. Follow our friends and family over at Fanbase Press. And um, once again, I want to thank our patrons for making this show possible. We have a brand new patron um, that we want to thank. Kevin Ortel, thank you so much for your contribution to uh, the podcast. Um, you can have your name called out as well as a thanks uh, for joining our $5 tier each month. We will shout you out. Uh, so Kevin, thank you so much for, for joining Patreon. Um, until next time, I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Drea Letamendi. And together we are The Arkham Sessions. told you was true from a certain point of view.